All right, uh, let's get started. So thanks all of you for joining us here today to talk about uh, access control for the cloud, AWS Identity and Access Management. Uh, hopefully I'll keep it lively uh, for your post-lunch uh, lull. Uh, my name is Jim Scharf. I am the director of our Identity and Access Management team. I've been with Amazon for a little over nine years now. All that time has been in Amazon Web Services, so I've really had kind of distinct honor of being from the early days and seeing how things have really grown uh, over the years. And now, you know, in the early days, I remember, you know, for every phone interview I was doing, interviewing people to join AWS, I'd spend about 45 minutes explaining what Amazon Web Services was trying to do. And then the, the remaining 15 minutes, I'd uh, spend explaining, you know, answering the question, what does that have to do with selling books? Uh, now, things have changed quite a bit. Uh, also, when I first joined, all of AWS uh, ran on 19 servers worldwide. So as you can imagine, things have changed a little bit uh, in the intervening time. So thanks for joining me. Uh, click. Yep. So uh, what we'll be covering here today is I'll be giving a bit of an overview of AWS Identity and Access Management. Won't go into all the, you know, uh, specific features, but just want to make sure that we level set uh, as we go. Uh, I will cover how you can enforce security policies in the cloud using IAM, and how you can integrate AWS Identity Access Management, or IAM, with your existing on-premises directories. And along the way, I'll try to do my best to highlight new features that we've added in the last year or so since uh, last year's reInvent. All right, I'm not going to use this anymore. So uh, what is identity access management? You know, anyone who is using a laptop here today or whatever, uh, anyone who's used a modern operating, mo modern operating system is probably pretty familiar with uh, access control and identity access management. In its essence, it really enables you to specify who can take what actions on which particular resources. So can Jane log in to that laptop, can Sue access a given file. It's probably pretty familiar to anyone who's, you know, anyone here today. So then, that brings to rise a question, what is AWS Identity and Access Management, and what makes that different? So AWS Identity and Access Management, or IAM, provides access control for AWS services and resources and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later on, that is flexible, powerful, familiar, and secure. Or at least we th that's what we strive to do. So as we go through this talk, I'll be drilling into each one of these keywords in a bit more detail, and that'll be kind of the breadcrumbs that we use to go through the talk. So the first keyword was flexible. So what do you think uh, about when uh, being flexible? Of course, uh, well, before I get into that, a quick show of hands to kind of get a little blood flowing after, after lunch. How many here in this room already use AWS? OK. Uh, how many initially tried AWS because of uh, cost? Was that the major factor driving you? OK, not so many. Uh, scale, was that the primary driver? OK, a bit more. Agility, okay. Or how many for you know, one of the given services, whether EC2 or Redshift or one of those was the kind of compelling need? Okay, a few less. Conversely, how many initially tried AWS because of security or identity? Okay, so you know, my point here is you know, you, you're usually drawn to Amazon Web Services for one of the prior needs, uh, yet look in the room and, and you know, look at all the, all the other security track talks, which are typically some of the most popular talks at uh, reInvent, and obviously you don't start out really, you know, focusing on security and identity, but it becomes a compelling need as you go. So, you know, as we go back to that word flexible, you know, first, uh, you know, you know, the first use case is usually some individual. It could be a college student in his dorm room, 
Uh, it could be uh, an employee at a startup or you know, uh, you know, a programmer at an enterprise and, and maybe you know, she just wants to try out, prototype a new idea um, even though the enterprise isn't using AWS in wide scale yet. And so the, the common usage pattern there is they hear about AWS either you know, via whatever means. They come to uh, the AWS website. They see, hey, there's even a free usage uh, tier available. And they say, well, well, why not? There's no reason not to sign up. So they go through creating an account. And for anyone who's purchased on the Amazon.com website, books, uh, streaming video, DVDs, what have you, pretty familiar experience. Provide, provide a username and password and a credit card, and away you go. And so quickly, uh, you can go and innovate and start launching EC2 instances, uh, storing files in S3, knowing that you can prototype these early ideas, and then if they become successful, you know, AWS has a scale to grow with you as, as you go. Now, you know, what, what's the point here? Well, really, in your initial uh, usage, you, you, most people are not really preoccupied with security and access control. You really kind of want you know, what's necessary, uh, but no more, because you really want to get right at prototyping that idea. And so AWS Identity and Access Management enables that by providing that familiar user experience that, that's really easy to use. Uh, and then you know, we'll, we'll get into more about how we can provide the security and access control features you need as you grow. Come on. Uh, so typically, maybe that, that idea you, you prototype uh, becomes successful. And you pull in more people to work on it. Maybe form a startup. Maybe you know, go to a small and medium-sized uh, business. And now, as you get into an organization, you have multiple people trying to access your AWS resources. And so you know, quickly, you get into a point where uh, you have many people in your organization who have different roles and responsibilities. And now you start thinking about, well, hey, you know, both from a security point of view, how do I ensure that you know, Brian can't access Graham's stuff? Uh, and also from availability point of view, you want to make sure that one employee can inadvertently you know, knock out something else uh, that some other employee is working on. And so drilling in on these roles a bit more in a bit more detail, so I put up some arbitrary, you know, hypothetical uh, access control business policies you might think about. You might want, hey, your, your DevOps type of personnel to have administrator access, that they should be able to control all AWS resources, including the ability to create new users. Because if you're the CEO of your startup or whatever, you don't want to be adding new users each time a new employee is onboarded. Uh, you may want to, you know, in sales marketing, you might want to give them read-only access to S3, but you, you certainly don't want them spinning up EC2 instances. And then uh, in finance and accounting, you may want to give them access to your billing information. Uh, but you, know, you don't want them to have the capability to knock out a production uh, EC2 server. And likewise, when I talk to most uh, finance and accounting folks, they don't want to have that capability. They just want to have the permissions they need to do their job, access the billing information, and nothing more. And so as these needs arise, that's where AWS Identity and Access Management comes into play. And so if you go to the AWS console, you can see IAM listed among the services there. And if you click there, you get a hopefully a pretty you know, easy to use uh, user interface where you can create users for those employees. Uh, you can manage the permissions. You can organize them into groups, et cetera. Now, I'm not going to walk through all of that process here. Uh, actually, last year's reInvent uh, talk, I did that in a bit more detail. But I thought I'd point out a few things here. If you see in the lower panel, you see that you know, for user Jim, you can specify whether uh, you want to give Jim access keys so that he or his applications can sign requests to AWS services, like store files in S3, read data from DynamoDB. Uh, or you can say, no, Jim's going to just do some administration via the AWS console, so I don't want to give uh, him keys. Uh, so I can go in and remove, rotate those keys, or, or just kill them all together. 
Uh, you can see in the bottom right here that if you, if you want Jim to be able to log into the ABIS console, you can go in and give him individual uh, sign-in sign credentials, so a password to go with his username. And uh, you can set that. And then also you can specify whether Jim must uh, have a multi-factor authentication device when logging into the console, something particularly important if you're giving Jim you know, more admin type access. Does that make sense? So we'll get back and drill into this in a bit more detail. So the highest level, IAM provides you the ability to you know, create users, uh, organize them in groups, set permissions. Uh, each user gets their own individual security credentials that you, you specify. And like I said, if, if you're creating a user for, say, you know, your website backup application to, say, write to S3, you probably don't want to specify a username and password for that, you know, that more system-level user. And likewise, if you have a, a human user that's only going to log into the console, you're not going to give them access keys. These users are secure by default, which means that they don't, they don't have any privileges unless you explicitly grant them uh, privileges. So, uh, you know, that means you have to go in and, and consciously add permissions uh, rather than starting with kind of star and taking them away. And, you know, it, it, IAM enables you to grant least privilege, which is a, you know, a longstanding security principle that you should only give uh, users, personnel, uh, the access they need to do their job and nothing else. And then we aim to make it easy to use. We provided a, a, graphic user, a graphical user interface in the AWS Management Console. And then, of course, we are Amazon Web Services, so everything that you can do in the console, every capability that we have, you can do via APIs and the command line interface. So that makes it easy for scripting, integrating with your uh, applications, and that kind of thing. Okay, so then, uh, you know, that's great. So you can do access control for your organization, your small, medium business. But what happens if you become even more successful or you, you, you're, you're an enterprise type cu customer or a government agency? Uh, does IAM provide the, the features you need for that? And when I talk to enterprise customers, everything comes down to one, uh, one factor for them and that's control. They really need to be able to have the control over their users, specify who can do uh, what, put, potentially put additional controls where, things, where users have very access to sensitive information, and of course they want to know that what they set up is doing uh, you know, what they intended. And so for that, IAM provides uh, additional features such as multi-factor authentication, so you can specify that users have to, you know, in addition to, say, a username and password, they also have to provide a multi-factor authentication code uh, when, say, logging into the website or even uh, when accessing APIs. And we support uh, hardware tokens as well as smartphone app tokens. So, you know, we provide one for Android, but, you know, a lot of customers already have Google Authenticator on their phone. So, uh, you know, you can use that, just add in another token for your IAM user and or root accounts, and we highly encourage that and provide you more enterprise level control. Uh, and of course, you can do that even if you're not an enterprise, if you have something uh, more critical that you want to protect. And then we have uh, credential management policies uh, that uh, allow you to specify whether users can change their own passwords. Uh, and then also things like the password strength and length and, uh, and that kind of thing. And then also you have the capability to specify controls around, you know, not just kind of file level access control, but controls around whether they can access the billing information, the AWS support site, uh, or even whether they can make purchases on the AWS marketplace. So, you know, we think that these kinds of control features are ones that would typically uh, appeal more to our enterprise customers. And so, you know, kind of wrapping up on this, on this flexible uh, word, you know, we believe that IAM provides flexible control that adapts with your needs, whether you're a developer, you know, maybe a smaller organization, or an enterprise. Uh, and, and also, you know, AWS has customers that have extremely stringent security uh, needs. 
And it forces us to continuously be raising the bar on our access control and security. And of course, all customers benefit. Uh, you know, and, and, and these also, you know that these capabilities are there should you need them, should you progress you know, to larger and larger organizations or, or just organizations that have different needs. And then, of course, IAM is uh, offered by AWS uh, at no additional charge. You pay for your use of S3 or EC2, uh, but we don't charge anything extra for using any of the IAM features. Um, so, moving on from uh, flexibility, uh, IAM is, is very powerful as well. So, why is that? Well, first, it's fully integrated throughout all the AWS services. So earlier I said AWS Identity Access Management provides access control for AWS services and resources. Now I'm going to hone in a little bit more on what I mean by services and resources. So of course, most customers are familiar with Amazon EC2 uh, and, and S3 for storing files. And you know, when you're talking access control, these are pretty familiar things. Hey, you know, access, uh, can someone access a, a server uh, can someone read that file? Uh, most, you know, most of us has, have operated with an operating system ha who have done that. But what AWS Identity and Access Management has some you know, uh, additional needs because we have to support all these other services as well. And of course, all the new ones that we announced this morning that I didn't get onto the slides. Uh, and, and so the point here is we have services that are really low level uh, primitives like you know, files in S3 or, or queues in SQS to higher level abstractions like uh, you know, Elastic, Amazon Elastic MapReduce, which will run clusters of EC2 nodes running your Hadoop jobs for you, or Redshift, which is a data warehouse in the cloud, or even, uh, you know, I said earlier, you know, market, AWS Marketplace uh, allowing whether you can make purchasing decisions. And so, AWS Identity and Access Management has to be powerful enough and flexible enough to adapt for both the width of all of the new services that, are, that have been added and are, are still coming down the pipe, as well as kind of going high and low in that stack to be able to do access control from everything from files to clusters to data warehouses and, 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 and everything in between. But we built it to do just that. So that's covering uh, AWS services. But then, of course, each of these services can uh, create and manage one or more resources. So again, I think everyone's familiar with access control to a server or an instance uh, and, and files. Those are very familiar concepts. But with AWS and all the diversity of services, there's also a huge diversity of, of the resources that we have to manage. And uh, again, uh, IAM was cr uh, created to be power powerful enough to kind of manage access control across the, the full gamut of what AWS has to offer. Okay, uh, another reason why I think uh, IAM uh, it can be very powerful is, you know, while uh, we, we provide very fine-grained uh, permissions, or at least enable you to go down to that finer grain of detail should you need it. Need it. So earlier we said, you know, access control enables you to do, specify who can take what actions on which resources. So can Joe read that file? But AWS IAM can take things a bit deeper. You can also specify when, uh, time of day, where, you know, from where, uh, from what IP range, or even how, whether or not Joe has uh, provided a multi-factor authentication code before trying to access that file. So now you can say, Joe uh, can read this file, uh, you know, Joe can read this particular file, but only during business hours specific time, uh, coming from this IP block, uh, when first authenticating with his MFA device. So we think, you know, uh, these are pretty, this fine grain capability really makes it uh, even more powerful. And then uh, last year when we were here, Amazon EC2 did support IAM users, but at the time, you could only specify that Sally could uh, launch or you know, start or stop EC2 instances, but you couldn't say Sally can only stop that particular EC2 instance. 
And of course, we've worked with the EC2 team to integrate that into uh, their offering, and, and they've added a lot of capabilities, and they're, they're more on the way. And so now you can do things like specify that pen, you know, Ben can terminate this particular instance, but not that one. Jeff can only launch instances uh, only in a particular subnet. Uh, Ken can only use a specific AMI, AMI, uh, you know, that maybe your IT department blessed or created, uh, but not other ones. Um, you can basically say a user can only take actions on resources if those uh, resources have been tagged with that person's username. And then we've added uh, policy variables, you see there, the dollar username. So now, dynamically, it can be evaluated uh, as you go, and that's pretty powerful, because now you can say, you know, well, I can only access my, uh, you know, uh, my sandbox box and, and not someone else's. And then you can take it further, because you can say, Derek must authenticate using multi-factor authentication before he can terminate instances with a ta uh, tag stack equals prod. So you, you can see that that additional check can be pretty powerful to make sure that it really is Derek uh, when taking down a, a critical website. Also, using MFA kind of makes people pause because they have to get something out of their pocket, so they really think before taking down that prod server. And then last year as well, Amazon DynamoDB, you could say uh, Joe could read or write to uh, a given table, but that was uh, the, the, as far as you can go. But recently, we added the ability to say, now Joe can read kind of by item or, or row from DynamoDB, which is pretty powerful because you can say, again, using kind of the, the user variable substitution, you can say he can only read rows that, ha that start with his username. Or by attribute or kind of column, so you could say, hey, Joe can read, uh, say the zip code and state fields, but not the email address or, or last name fields. Or you can combine the two and specify both uh, item and attribute combinations. So we think this is pretty powerful, uh, particularly when combined with some of the other things I'm gonna talk about uh, in a little bit. IAM is also pretty powerful because it enables delegation. So delegation is basically saying, enabling someone else to act on my behalf. And we do that via this entity we call an IAM role. It's basically an entity that defines a set of permissions. And the, uh, you know, there's no user or group associated with that role, but roles can be assumed by a user that you trust to, uh, to assume it. And I'll go into this in a bit more detail. And the first way we, uh, when we first launched IAM roles was with this specific feature uh, was the first one, IAM roles for Amazon EC2. So if you have an application running on EC2 that has to act, uh, has to call other AWS services, uh, read and write uh, files to S3, read data from DynamoDB, et cetera, you know, most customers are faced with uh, originally were tr faced with a trade-off. They could either uh, build something that would securely get their AWS signing keys out to their instances, which was a whole lot of muck that you know, they didn't want to do, but it was necessary to do things you know, very securely, or they were forced to make less secure decisions. Uh, of course, I know no one in this room would do this, but you know, things like putting their secret keys directly embedded in their code. Uh, well, please don't do that. Uh, what our roles for EC2 will enable you to do is you can create a role with a set of permissions, and then you can launch an EC2 instance with that role. And that's in the more advanced tab of the EC2 launch wizard. So now you can create a role saying, uh, uh, you know, web server backup can, can write data to S3, and then you can launch your instances with that. Credentials are rotated uh, are automatically uh, get out to your EC2 instances, and we take care of rotating them multiple times per day. And then if you're using the AWS SDK, it transparently uses the credentials, so you don't have to put any credentials in your, in your source code, uh, and the SDK takes care of picking up the latest credentials as we rotate them out there to you. And I'll give you a quick graphical depiction here. So 
if, your if the orange is your instance and, and the blue is your, applica your application, and let's say you need to uh, access DynamoDB and S3 f to make your application uh, powerful, what you can do is you can go out to IAM and create a role and say, hey, I want to grant read-write access to uh, files in, in S3 and rows in DynamoDB to anyone who I enable to uh, assume that role. Then, as your application, particularly, this is really powerful as you start auto-scaling and having many hosts coming up and down, uh, now uh, you, you launch those EC2 instances specifying that they can have uh, access to this role. And what we take care of is we get AWS temporary credentials out to those hosts automatically for you, and again, rotate them multiple times per day. Note that the key is not in your application. Your application uses the SDK, which then uh, takes care of using the key, a temporary credential, rather. And so the benefits here, you don't have to use long-term credentials. You, don't, you certainly don't put anything in your code, uh, any credentials in your code. Credentials are rotated multiple times per day for you. Um, and then it's actually less coding. And the AWS SDK does all the hard work. And this is a feature that you know, I really think is, is really powerful because it's one of the rare combinations that's both easier for you and it's more secure. So if you haven't checked this one out, I highly recommend uh, looking into this one. And then, of course, another thing about being powerful is the scale. Uh, this, I think, you come to expect from Amazon Web Services, and IAM is, is certainly no different here. Uh, we have to do access control for literally trillions of resources. And, of course, the number of resources is growing rapidly every day, thanks to you all using AWS. As we're sitting here now, our authentication and authorization services are having to uh, you know, do authentication authorization for millions uh, of requests per second uh, as we're sitting here. And then AWS has hundreds of thousands of customers spread across 190 countries, each of whom can be accessing AWS with one to potentially millions of identities. And IAM takes care of all that. And then, of course, you know, we have servers now I want to let you know that I was officially told by PR I can share with you the highly coveted server counts. Uh, we have lots. And then, of course, everything AWS does uh, is global, and IAM has to be in all uh, data center regions worldwide. So what I find really interesting about the space is you know, access control and identity are pretty well-proven concepts that have been around for quite a number of years in the industry. Uh, but the difference is adapting it to the unique needs of the, uh, the cloud. And because of the scale uh, and, you know, in terms of requests per second, number of resources, and global distribution, it, it, you know, IAM becomes a global uh, distributed systems uh, problem and not just a security or identity problem. That's what really keeps it fresh and interesting for, for us. Okay, so we talked about being powerful. Uh, we also think that IAM can be very familiar. And you know, the first way uh, we try to do that is provide you a, a fairly familiar user interface where you can, uh, via UI, create users, manage permissions, et cetera. So you know, I showed this to one customer. Back when we first launched IAM, they, they said, oh, we're trying to make sure we got everything clear. And they're like, yeah, Jim, users, groups, permissions, duh, I got it. Uh, so that actually was pretty validating for the team because we're trying to make it very familiar uh, to you because uh, we don't want to make your access control and identity uh, management any more confusing than it needs to be. And then, you know, uh, you can, we make a lot of simple templates available so that if you create a user and you want to give uh, least privilege, you can go through and select from templates like read only access to S3 or, you know, there are a whole bunch of templates in there. Or you can use the policy generator, which is the next one down. Or if you're really advanced, you can start uh, you know, either write in or, or copy from documentation, custom po policies in there. But one of the things we've heard from customers is, hey, hey uh, that's great. But once I start getting more advanced, I get a little bit worried uh, that I'm not quite sure if I understand that what I intended to do is actually taking effect. 
So we recently announced uh, the launch, the IM policy simulator that allows you to test the uh, effect of your access control policies before pushing them into production. Uh, it also helps you verify and trouble permit, uh, troubleshoot permissions that you might have. And so the way you get there is you just go to the IAM console. And in this more to explore over there, in the bottom right is the policy simulator. And so you can see on the left are the users that I had in my IAM account. We slurp that in along with all the information about them. Uh, users, groups, or you can actually, uh, in that top, there it says mode existing policies, you can actually go and deselect that and just kind of do things freehand as well. So let's zoom in on Sally and let's explore uh, a bit more. So as we click on Sally, it reveals that I had previously, in, in my AWS account, set up a couple of policies applying to S Sally. This po uh, power user template and then some deny uh, policy as well. And so next, we can go through and say, well, what do we want to simulate? We can select the services and actions we want to see. We want to say, hey, can Sally, you know, Sally is calling up you know, a help desk and saying that she can't start uh, instances. Why is that? So we can select EC2 uh, actions, and I just selected them all right now for EC2. And then if we click the Run Simulation button over the, in the top right, now you can see it runs the permission simulation, and you can see by EC2 action uh, what Sally can and cannot do. And so if she called saying, hey, I can't start or run instances, now we say, yeah, well, that's, that's why we're, she's denied. We can drill in to understand that more by clicking on that list uh, link there. And what that does is in the left-hand pane, it brings up the actual policy statement that is leading to us uh, to conclude that Sally will be denied when she makes a call to EC2. Uh, now, uh, what that lets you do is, well, you can see that policy block, and then you can either edit it or decide you know, whether that was what you wanted to do or, or wasn't. So we can go remove the policy in the IAM console or, or make adjustments. And overall, uh, you know, we think this is really just the first step towards a lot of you know, ease of use uh, additions we can make to IAM you know, permissions management. Uh, so definitely would ask you to try this out and give us feedback uh, on the IAM forums. So still talking about being from IAM being familiar, one thing I find that a lot of customers get a little bit confused about is EC2, because EC2 is a little bit of a different beast. And specifically, EC2 enables you to interact with familiar operating system access controls that you're, you've been used to doing uh, for years. So of course, Amazon EC2 enables you to launch a virtual server. So you make a run instances API call. And then IAM, of course, governs the access control of whether you can or cannot do that. So if Sally was making this call, once we went back and changed her permissions uh, to enable her to do run instances, well, then Sally will be able to launch an EC2 instance. Uh, and when she does that, Sally specifies not just the hardware type, uh, you know, what kind of uh, EC2 instance type, but also you know, she specifies the operating system that she wants running on that EC2 instance, which of course can be you know, Windows or any Unix flavor or, or what have you. And so my point here is once you have that instance running, all of the access control to files within that ephemeral EC2 instance or applications running on your instance, that's all familiar. That's, that's your, you know, your Windows or, or Unix uh, system administration that people have been doing for years, pardon me. So hopefully that, that cl clarifies that a little bit because that, that's one that uh, I found customers sometimes get a little uh, confused about. So you know, we've talked about how IAM enables you to create and manage users in the AWS Identity Access Management System. Uh, and hopefully, we, we make that fairly familiar uh, experience. And hopefully, we'll continue to iterate on that to make that even better and more familiar to you. But what would be even more familiar is if you just manage your identities in your own system that you've had for the last and, you know, however many years. 
And so Enterprise Federation uh, enables you to do that. You can create your users, you know, continue to manage your users in your on-premise directory, whether it be open uh, LDAP or Active Directory, uh, and then enable those users to access AWS. And so with that, uh, you can enable your users, your employees, or what have you, to uh, access AWS websites, su such as the AWS console, and or AWS APIs. Uh, and, and we're the relying party in, in uh, identity federation parlance there. And then we've provided uh, you know, Windows Active Directory uh, package samples as well as Shibboleth. And how this works is, if on the left-hand side uh, represents your enterprise, and the right-hand side is AWS, your employees log in to their corporate uh, laptops with their familiar username and password, as they always have. And of course, as they do there, that they're authenticated against Active Directory and said, yep, you know, uh, Joe still has, he's an employee here and still has access. And then as he goes to, uh, say, an intranet portal uh, inside your company that says, hey, as part of your job, Joe, we need you to go you know, do some stuff in AWS, maybe launch uh, or shut down in EC2 instances, uh, he is redirected, uh, browser redirect, to uh, the AWS console, and, and it basically has a single sign-on experience. He never uh, provides his username and password again. He only authenticates locally. And, and Joe does not exist in our IAM uh, solution. Uh, so the benefits here for you as an administrator is that you can continue managing your users in your on-premises uh, directory like you have. You know, if your uh, auditors have already been you know, auditing that, uh, that can continue as, as needed. If you terminate an employee or a contract or whatever, you can do that in one spot and know that that'll take effect in AWS. And for your users, they continue one familiar username and password uh, so they don't get password fatigue. Uh, so that's, uh, we've had this capability for quite some uh, while. And then I uh, hope you guys have heard that on, on Monday we launched Federation uh, using SAML, uh, specifically SAML 2.0. And the benefits here are, well, one, it's, it's an open standard. So, you know, for people who fear kind of lock-in or, or, you know, some kind of proprietary configuration, uh, that addresses that. It's quicker and easier to implement, uh, specifically if you're using existing uh, identity management software, uh, you know, that already supports SAML 2.0. And a bit of an anecdote, we launched this on Monday night, and between Monday and now, we've had a couple of different partners that uh, tested this integration. Two partners both did it in less than 11 minutes each. Uh, so, you know, I think we took uh, this really, when we say it's quicker and easier to implement, it's really uh, significantly uh, quicker uh, and easier. And then, of course, you can enable via the SML Federation to access the AWS Management Console, as well as enabling uh, access to AWS APIs. So what this can potentially enable use cases such as, I want every employee laptop backed up to S3. Well, you could have an application running on every employee laptop that you know, once the user is authenticated uh, to uh, your Active Directory domain, uh, will automatically back up that employee's laptop to S3 automatically. Uh, so that's the kind of use case that this would enable, uh, because some people, when talk about federation to APIs, it's, a bit of a new concept, so I just wanted to talk through that. And then, of course, since federation is, by definition, bridging between your on-premises environment and AWS, uh, partner integrations are highly critical here. And we're really happy. We've been working with a number of partners uh, uh, who have publicly posted about their integrations with us. Uh, there are some other ones that I think are quickly in the, in the works, particularly since we added the SAML uh, uh, integration on Monday. Uh, so you know, if, if you know of any partners or you working with any partners that you'd like to see uh, up here on the list, please contact us and, and uh, we'd be happy to add their links uh, to our, our site. Come on. And then, so we talked about Enterprise Federation. Uh, but, you know, hey, what about, what about other types of federation? Well, we, earlier this year, we launched Web Identity Federation. And 
What that is, it enables you to build an application that authenticates your customers using third-party identity providers such as Google, Facebook, or Facebook, or log in with Amazon, which enables you to use uh, customers to sign in with their Amazon.com username and password, the same one my mom uses to, to buy books uh, she can now use to you know, uh, authenticate to your mobile app if you were to use this. And so you can enable scenarios like authenticate my customers with, say, Facebook credentials, and then uh, securely store, let them store, say, avatar images for a game down in S3 or high scores down in DynamoDB, uh, all with no server-side uh, code. So really, uh, you know, in Andy's, Andy's keynote this morning, he was talking about the power, uh, you know, that mobile plus cloud together can be really powerful. We think, you know, with Web Identity Federation, that, you know, enabling your applications to access data from Amazon S3, DynamoDB, or uh, Simple Notification Service, where we added uh, push notifications earlier this year. We think there's a really powerful combination of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, your mobile code, the mobile SDKs, uh, login, uh, Web Identity Federation, and then some of the more, you know, fine-grained user permissions that we talked about in Amazon DynamoDB. So we're really excited about this. And the way this looks is your users uh, would go to their uh, either mobile application or web application, uh, authenticate against a web uh, identity provider such as Facebook, uh, Google, or Amazon. Those are ones we've added uh, at initial launch. Then they, uh, with that authentication uh, token, they call out to our security token service and get a temporary credential that gives them uh, uh, authorized access to do specific things that you specify via a role uh, in AWS. And then that application can direct, then make direct calls to S3, DynamoDB, or Simple Notification Service, uh, all, again, with no server-side code. You don't have a, have a proxy fleet or anything like that. And then the SDK team added uh, the Java, uh, JavaScript SDK just uh, recently. And you know, that's where I was saying it, it's not just mobile applications. You can do some pretty powerful uh, web applications as well, directly from browser straight to S3 uh, or DynamoDB and that kind of thing. And then you know, it's, I said, well, you can write code to do this. Well, you know, I think that's really where you're, you know, you're going to get to if you think this is a feature for you. But how do you know if this is the feature for you? Well, to let you, uh, you know, try that out with, without any code, we launched this Web Identity Federation Playground. And what that is, it's a user interface, uh, you know, it's a UI tool that allows you to try it out with no coding required. So you go to it, and you can either choose your Facebook, Google, or uh, log in with Amazon credentials. And then using your personal account with any of those providers, you can log in. You can see the tokens that come back from those providers, and as well as the token exchange with our STS service, uh, which is really helpful because it lets you kind of debug and, and, uh, and or really understand what's going on if you really want to look under the covers. And then it'll let you at, uh, list files in our uh, test S3 bucket that we put out there, so you can actually see uh, data coming back from S3. So you can see the, the whole thing end to end, all with no code, uh, coding required, to get a bit more of an understanding. So we talked about IAM being flexible, powerful, familiar. Uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, frankly, you know, first in our mind, is it is secure. And you know, just one thing to kind of help convey this is we use IAM internally uh, to authenticate uh, AWS services internally uh, for an internal auth authentication. And then, of course, a lot of our services are built on top of uh, AWS services. We use, my team uses EMR to un uh, analyze our logs. We use S3 as part of our systems. We use DynamoDB. Uh, and so all of this is pretty well tested by us and used by us uh, throughout. And so when I say secure, well, what are the things I think of? Well, one, you know, we talked about really powerful controls. Uh, 
you know, we talked about multi-factor authentication, password credential management policies. We talked about it in an enterprise context, but of, of course, many people who use these features are not enterprises. They're just people who really say, you know, the information I have or the, the resources I have on Amazon Web Services is highly critical. It's important to me. I don't care about some enterprise or some auditor. I want to lock this down. And of course, we private, provide this to you. Another really powerful control is one that I uh, think is really not well understood. Um, and to that end, I'm going to talk about it here. And there's a whole session uh, uh, t today or tomorrow? Tomorrow uh, on delegating access across your accounts. Uh, and what this enables you to do is you can say, hey, I want to you know, delegate access across accounts using roles. And, and why you may want to do that is, let's say your company has multiple AWS accounts, and your IT administrator or some kind of administrator needs to access all of those accounts. Well, before we provide this capability, you would have had to either give that administrator you know, root access, which I don't recommend, uh, or created, you know, say, Joe, the, the administrator, an IAM user Joe, in each one of those, say, 10 AWS accounts. Uh, well, with this, you don't need to do that. You can basically you know, have Joe in one account and, and give, give him the uh, capabilities to uh, access those other AWS accounts that you, you trust him with. Another model we've seen is you may say, you know what, I'm create, I want to create and, and manage my users in IAM, uh, but I want to manage that all under one AWS account. So I see all my users in one place. It's just simple and clean for me. Uh, but then I want to give my developers access to multiple AWS accounts. Either you, know, you might have different AWS accounts for you know, prod and test or by different project or cost center or what have you. And now you can do that and control all your users in, in one place within IAM. And then you know, I think last but, but certainly not least, uh, actually a really highly critical use case, is if you, uh, need to, if you want to trust a third party, you know, say a partner or vendor, to do things for you in your AWS environment, say analyze your logs uh, for you, or you know, maybe do, manage your EC2 instances or manage backups for you, uh, you can use uh, delegated access to let, give them access without giving them long-term credentials. So how does that work? There's really two... Uh, steps involved. First is a setup set step. And so if, let's say there's an account on the left, uh, uh, you know, one, two, three, you know, that, that account number in blue, and then your account that you want uh, to give access to is that one, 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 uh, one that has uh, data stored in DynamoDB. And let's say the use case is you want to give the IAM user Jeff access to that account. First, you create a role. And the first part of doing that is you say that who can assume this role? And in this case, you're saying, hey, I'm going to trust the 12345 account uh, and any users that that admin uh, sets under that account to access my role. And then when someone can assume this role, these are the capabilities or these are the permissions that that uh, person can have. In this case, it's basically read access to DynamoDB. So you're saying, I trust the account in blue. But then, you know, the account in blue has to say, well, who do I trust to, uh, you know, take this responsibility on? And so they create a, uh, uh, permissions for user Jeff that explicitly say, yep, I'm going to allow Jeff to assume that role. So there's a mutual trust process established. Uh, and once that's set up, now Jeff can use this to access the account in orange. So the first step is he authenticates to AWS with Jeff's access keys, uh, not you know, in, in the blue account, not anything to do with the orange. And he's re returned back temporary credentials that grant him access to that, that DDB role that we named. And then once he has those temporary credentials, he can present them to DynamoDB uh, to directly to read data from DynamoDB. So I think this is a pretty powerful feature and uh, one that from talking to customers, I, I think a lot of people just are not very familiar with it. So I definitely urge you to check it out. We've done some, um, there's been an AWS blog post on it, um, and we're happy to direct you to more information on it. So then, you know, all this access control and setting everything up, uh, setting your policy is great, but part of it is being able to uh, 
you know, the assurance that it's actually working. So that's where audit comes into play. And so if you're in the keynote this morning, you know that we're really excited to announce that AWS CloudTrail has been launched, which logs API calls uh, to your, uh, you know, within your AWS account uh, to the following services. And of course, IAM and the security token service are on that list. So now you can have all uh, changes, administrative changes to IAM or even federated access uh, you know, to get these temporary credentials logged uh, via AWS CloudTrail. And then of course, you know, additional services will be added over time and you know, urge you to give AWS CloudTrail feedback on which ones you think are, are most critical. And again, your, your, your account's API calls are, are logged and delivered to your S3 bucket and you can optionally get uh, SNS notifications of new log files as they arrive. And of course, analyzing data, uh, particularly security log analysis, can be uh, a bit of a bear sometimes. So we're really pleased to see that uh, we, we, the, we, the CloudTrail team worked directly with a number of partners to get uh, integrated. And they're out, a lot of these are out on the uh, expo floor and have some pretty cool demos set up. So I'd definitely urge you to stop by and check those out. And then another way of kind of auditing to know whether you're doing the right thing is Trusted Advisor. And you know, hopefully people have heard of Trusted Advisor. It analyzes your account and, and recommends things for, uh, for you. Uh, and you can do it via uh, the user interface or also they have APIs you can integrate with your own uh, tooling. And you know, I think most people hear about Trusted Advisor because it can recommend cost savings uh, you know, when people are leaving instances running, that kind of thing. But there's a security category of, uh, as well. And so there are a number of IAM recommendations in there, uh, such as you know, making sure you have multi-factor authentication on your root account. How many people have multi-factor authentication on your root account? Oh, please, please do that. <laughs> please do not leave reInvent without adding MFA on your root account. Uh, anyway, if you log into Trust Advisor, you'll get a nice report of how you're stacking up on these security uh, uh, turning on the security features. Come on. And then, of course, none of this matters if we're not operating our cloud secure, uh, securely. And that's where compliance comes in. Uh, you know, AWS goes through a, a number of regular, very regular uh, third-party evaluations, and we have a number of uh, compliance certifications here that talk to that. And of course, we follow these but, you know, based on what our customers need. So if you have specific ones for your industry or business, let us know. Uh, we recently launched two, or not launched, but posted two new uh, white papers, security best practices. Uh, this is like a 54-page doc that really goes into a lot of detail, it has some models that you can follow, and gives prescriptive guidance on a range of topics. Of course, IAM and managing your identities, but also things like uh, implementing data security, monitoring, alerting, incident response, and securing your operating systems and applications. So I highly encourage that. We also just recently put out the Securing Data at Rest with Encryption white paper. Uh, so encourage that one. And then the AWS security blog. This actually comes, you know, you probably heard a lot that in AWS we follow uh, what we hear from customers. And this comes directly out of uh, reInvent last year. When we're talking to customers uh, at reInvent in the security booth last year, they said, hey, we're really interested in security and IAM topics, but hey, AWS ships so many different features, it's hard to keep track uh, of, and, and just listen into just the security stuff. And two, we'd like a bit more dr uh, drill down and prescriptive guidance. So earlier this year, we let, uh, launched the security blog. And uh, you can see we're trying to be a bit more prescriptive, you know, getting into a bit more detail with code snippets and that kind of thing. Uh, as well as hitting a wide range of topics, not just IAM, but uh, compliance and VPC and, and that kind of thing. Uh, so we'd love to hear more either on the security floor or uh, on the forums or on the blog itself if you have any ideas. And I just have a couple more uh, summary uh, slides here. So in summary, AWS Identity Access Management, it's flexible. You know, whether you're individual use or enterprise, we think we, we have the capabilities that you need. It's highly powerful, um, you know, from the scale that you expect from AWS to delegation, fine-grained permissions, and integrated throughout the AWS services. Uh, it's familiar whether you're using, managing your identities in our system or using federation. 
And then it's secure. You know, we provide powerful controls. We give you auto capabilities and compliance. Uh, for more information, provide some links, the security blog or Twitter handle. We also are going to have a session, an open session uh, in Toscana 3605 tomorrow from 4 to 6 p.m. So come by, and if you have any feature requests or questions, uh, either that or the security booth are great times. And then, you know, I think here are some other talks that we think you might be interested in. Uh, if you found this one helpful, these go in a, in a bit more detail on specific topics, including that uh, SEC 303 delegating access to your environment. And then last but not least, uh, you know, please fill out the feedback. If you go into the app on the mobile uh, app, you can fill in feedback. We, you know, at, in Amazon, we just obsess about customer feedback. And, uh, you know, so your feedback on this talk, this session, and I am overall, uh, we'd really, really value that. Uh, and, and you're going to have some surprises and, uh, prizes and giveaways. And so with that, I have time maybe for one or two questions if anyone has.